Um, one of the questions was, when we sent this out, did, did regionally, was there, did, did organizations uh, respond in the rates that they were represented in the initial data set? And generally the answer is yes. So in other words, um, the, blue, the blue column is, and when you look at Africa, 12% of our original data set was made up of African NGOs or NGOs that were based in Africa, and of the total response, slightly less, 9% responded. So it's not as if we sent it out and we only got a tiny response rate from certain regions. It was, it was, fairly, it was fairly even there. I was mentioning before the education of the respondents, and this was something important for us to look at in thinking about what attitudes might be toward refugees, and we see that pretty well-educated respondents here. So college or university uh, educated, 60%, and then another 36% had one or more years of co college or university. So we're talking about a fairly well-educated group of people. Um, we also were interested in what kind of services were provided by these NGOs around the world. Again, we're talking about refugee organizations, and they're doing different things within their organizations to help, re help refugees. So a lot were doing social services, law and advocacy, education, and health, and then other things along the way. But you know, it, it runs the gamut of, type, of types of services that they were providing. Um, then we began to look at, in our questions, who were they serving? And we wanted to analyze the whole range of refugees that they provided protection to. So when you look at the top of the, the slide, you see gender identity. The blue, when we asked them, did you serve anyone who was fleeing persecution based on gender identity in the last year? Only about 30% of them responded. This is all the respondents from anywhere in the world. Another block said no, and another block really had no idea. So the, the folks that said no idea, it could be that they were providing services to refugees where the claim ground didn't come out, so they might be you know, doing education or housing assistance, so they wouldn't know. You're a refugee, we're helping you out, we don't know what your claim ground is. But you see there that gender identity, the yes on gender identity is quite low, as is sexual orientation when compared to the bottom graph, which is this political opinion, which people know, often know more about. Um, the other thing that we were interested in, in learning was like, how does that get dispersed in, in regionally? Who's responding in what way from which countries around the world? And the interesting responses, like when we look at, um, for instance, the big bar there, it says uh, for the Middle East, you see that 86% of the respondents from the Middle East said that they had served um, somebody who was fleeing persecution. Uh, of those who had served somebody, 86% um, said that they had served somebody on the basis of gender identity. So there is an interesting dispersal, but I should note that there's small numbers. So if you look down at the bottom, actually the number of respondents that we got from this region was only 12. So I don't want to put too much weight on what these kind of graphs look like. Um, because we're, we're talking about specific, um, fairly small numbers. Um, one of the things that we were also interested in was ethical guidelines or codes of conduct. That's often reflective of attitudes about uh, cat protected categories of individuals. So we wanted to know, A, do you have a code of conduct or do you have ethical guidelines that are in the workplace? And if you do, do they include uh, sexual orientation or gender identity? So this, so this picture is just of those organizations that do have those guidelines, we wanted to know whether they included gender identity or sexual orientation as a protected category. And then this, this one shows how that's distributed. So if you look at the, the Africa bar on the left, 55% um, of those organizations that are based in Africa that have ethical guidelines or codes of conduct include sexual orientation or gender identity. 92% North America and Europe. And that actually represents a much larger group of organizations as well because they're, if you look down at the bottom, it's 134 respondents of the total. So take that as you will. Um, again, like I said in the beginning, we were curious about religion. Does it play a role in your work? And if it does, does that have any impact on your willingness to protect LGBTI refugees. 
There were some interesting, you know, interesting responses here, but like I said, when we did the comparison to the willingness, it made no difference. You know, and I, and I think that that's valuable because it really does help us think about who is out there, uh, who are our allies, and who's doing the work um, in, a, in an egalitarian way in protecting LGBT refugees. Um, another thing that we wanted to basically understand was attitudes about sexual orientation and gender identity. So take it out of the refugee context. Let's not talk about whether you're providing services or not or how you're doing it. What are your general attitudes and opinions um, about sexual orientation and gender identity? So we asked an, a series of questions, and these are sort of the, the, the central ones that we wanted to learn about. Um, the, the top question is about gender identity. What is your opinion about somebody who is born with one sex and presents as another gender or sex? And the blue there is, is it's quite, it's quite long, and it says they don't believe that it's wrong at all. So that's, you know, it's close to 70%, um, and that's quite a large number. It's pretty similar for the second question, which is about um, opinion about sexual relations between two consenting adults. The one thing to note there is when you look at the purple, that it, the response rate there is always wrong. And so you see that for sexual orientation, there tended to be a greater response rate saying that's always wrong than gender identity issues, which is something for us to think about. Um, we also wanted to know about the one's expression of sexual orientation or gender identity and whether whether Eddie was talking about this issue about discretion and whether you, you're meant to hide your sexual orientation to, to, to survive in your country of origin. So we were interested in attitudes about that. So again, um, we asked questions that had to do with the various categories. So the first one at the top there is um, transgender individuals born male should present themselves as males to avoid persecution. <laughs> And you know, the, the 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 blue and the red you could read together because they're strongly disagree and disagree. Quite high, close to eighty percent. <coughs> Same is true for lesbians and homosexual men. So the attitudes generally were, no, you don't have to hide to avoid persecution. Interestingly, there was even a higher um, supportive answer for bisexuals. You don't have to be in a heterosexual relationship. To, to, to protect yourself from persecution. Um, question about intersex was kind of more all over the place. And that may reflect the fact that people don't know what intersex is. Um, and so the question there had to do with whether one should have to, to you know, choose one sex or another. And, and there was less of a response rate that um, reflected that people understood the issues there. And so so the, the, the next two slides are the core of our survey. Do they deserve protection? Does this population deserve protection, according to you, <coughs> you as responding to this, this survey? And we got a very high response rate. People knew what they perhaps felt or what they perceived to be the correct answer here, which is that, yes, number, number four is the answer is definitely, and number one would be definitely not. So we see that there are fairly, you know, fairly high response rates there highest in Latin America and the Caribbean, but I mean the lowest is not much lower than that. The same is true for are you willing to serve LGBTI refugees? There's slight variance there. We weren't really sure how to interpret why somebody might feel like they deserve protection uh, and then that, that they wouldn't be willing to provide protection and probably that is something, information that we'd have to learn through an interview, but again, higher than three here. So much closer to willing and definite or definitely willing than unwilling. When looking at that, we wanted to know, like I said initially, whether contact with LGBT people had any kind of impact in their willingness to provide protection. So we asked people, do you, do you have any close friends? Do you have relatives? Do you know somebody who's LGBTI? And so all but 15% answered yes, 70% 70, 70 said they had close friends, 15% said that they knew somebody. Um, and we looked at it regionally as well, so that we see that Latin American and the Caribbean 
most, almost all, said that they had close friends or relatives who were LGBTI or knew somebody, which was interesting, just to look at the breakdown about where people know or have friends who are gay, lesbian, trans, etc. cetera. Um, and this was the slide that, this was the data that I found most interesting. Um, we broke down by category of LGBTI. Are you willing to serve a homosexual man? And those people who said that they had close friends or relatives, almost at almost 100%, said that they would be willing to provide protection to somebody on this basis, a, a gay man who had a refugee claim. Somebody who had no contact with anybody who was LGBTI was way down before the 60%, uh, lower than 60%. So we thought that this was a powerful indicator in terms of how to make recommendations going ahead. Um, finally, we also wanted to know, were, th were there any other factors that might influence the number of, of LGBTI refugees that are served? So we wanted to ask, do you have a relationship with the UN Refugee Agency and any other agencies? Um, close to two-thirds said that they had a relationship with the UNHCR, and so that when we asked them about, have you served anybody who's LGBTI in the last year? If you look at gender identity on the left, you see that those who have a connection to UNHCR are quite a bit more likely to say that they actually served LGBTI refugees than those who didn't. And the same is true for sexual orientation and some other categories as well. But we thought it was quite stark when you looked at gender identity there. Um, so those are, this is what we found when we, when we ran the data. And, um, you know, I think what was probably surprising to us, as I mentioned, was that, there, that while there is some variance in terms of regional responses, it's pretty similar. And um, I think one of the things that struck us, though, when looking at the data is that um, although we got a great response rate, 25%, maybe 35%, we wondered what was going on with the other 65%, 75%. And I think the concern from a methodolo methodological perspective is some of the worst environments for LGBTI refugees, um, you know, the person who receives that survey is just going to go, delete. And so we're not really sure, you know, how do you interpret that and what do you do with that information? And I think that in sitting with this data, we've come to the conclusion that this is a starting point. Um, and that while it's a great way of looking at what well-educated managers of NGOs around the world serving refugees are saying, maybe it raises some questions for us about the organizations that don't want to respond to the survey, and also what's going on with the frontline staff. So a manager might say, of course, willing, able, great, deserve protection, absolutely. But what's going on with the person answering the phone? What's going on with the person who's the intake officer and so on? In fact, there was a great um, quote from somebody who answered an open-ended question who said, I answered the survey using my own personal opinions. However, I think many others in our organization would have answered very differently. Discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity is extremely common among the folks that we serve and even among our staff. So this is the kind of information that these in-depth interviews are you know, we want to learn a little bit more about, and so that we can make recommendations about, you know, do I do I have ethical a code of conduct or ethical um, guidelines that includes SOGI issues? Um, how does my frontline staff feel about refugees fleeing persecution based on sexual orientation or gender identity or LGBTI refugees? Um, how can I evaluate that? How can I conduct? training or sensitivity training with my staff that's going to be appropriate for them? And where do I go for services or the kind of the resources that I need to, to introduce this training? Because I don't have the foggiest idea, you know, how to train on <coughs> sexual orientation and gender identity issues. How do I get the support that I need to create a welcoming environment? So these are the kinds of things that, um, that we learned from this data. We're really hopeful that we're going to get even more nuanced responses from these interviews. And when we do, we will finalize the report, and uh, and hopefully all of you guys will check it out on the website. I have a question. Yeah. Um, would it be possible to find out you know, from these NGOs that are doing some of the work? Yeah. What do they think are the stumbling blocks? What are, what what is preventing them from doing 
more. Yes. Uh, and I perhaps identify some three or four key things and then figure out what everybody agrees is what's the difficulty in getting there or doing the work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a critical point because until you know what the specific blocks are, you can't then make a, a recommendation. You know, if the, if the issue is that nobody wants to talk about it out loud, how can you do a training or how can you raise the issues in a way that create safety for the, the, the staff people, for instance? You know, so there are issues around that as well. And so getting recommendations about those specific blockages or what, you know, challenges and what would be an effective way of addressing those that's culturally appropriate, that's appropriate to the legal environment in that country is going to be really, really important. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, was there a question? Sorry. Yeah, was there any information in terms of the, the organizations that you work with, if they were local NGOs or international NGOs? Yeah. And then also the, the staff, if they were local staff or expat? Yeah, you know, actually we do have, I can show you the data there that we did want to know, are you a local organization and do you have links to an international <coughs> organization? So we do have that data. Um, I actually don't know what the breakdown is without looking at it. And one of the questions also is, is it international and, and <coughs> local staff to get a sense of that? But yeah, I'll, I'll sh I'm happy to show you the Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you. So the, the, the next two slides are the core of our survey. Do they deserve protection? Does this population deserve protection according to you, <coughs> you as responding to this, this survey? And we got a very high response rate. People knew what they perhaps felt or what they perceived to be the correct answer here, which is that, yes, number, f number four is the answer is definitely, and number one would be definitely not. So we see that there are fairly, you know, fairly high response rates there. Highest in Latin America and the Caribbean, but I mean the lowest is not much lower than that. The same is true for are you willing to serve LGBTI refugees? There's slight variance there. We weren't really sure how to interpret why somebody might feel like they deserve protection uh, and then that, that they wouldn't be willing to provide protection and probably that is something, information that we have to learn through an interview. But again, higher than three here. So much closer to willing and definite, or definitely willing than unwilling. When looking at that, we wanted to know, like I said initially, whether contact with LGBT people had any kind of impact in their willingness to provide protection. So we asked people, do you, do you have any close friends? Do you have relatives? Do you know somebody who's LGBTI? And so all but 15% answered yes. 70% 70, 70 said they had close friends. 15% said that they knew somebody. Um, and we looked at it regionally as well, so that we see that Latin American and the Caribbean, most, almost all, said that they had close friends or relatives who were LGBTI or knew somebody, which was interesting, just to look at the breakdown about where people know or have friends who are gay, lesbian, trans, etc. cetera. Um, and this was the slide that, this was the data that I found most interesting. Um, we broke down by category of LGBTI are you willing to serve a homosexual man? And those people who said that they had close friends or relatives, almost at almost 100% said that they would be willing to provide protection to somebody on this basis, a, a gay man who had a refugee claim. Somebody who had no contact with anybody who was LGBTI was way down before the 60%, uh, lower than 60%. So we thought that this was a powerful indicator in terms of how to make recommendations going ahead. Um, finally, we also wanted to know, were, th were there any other factors that might influence the number of, of LGBTI refugees that are served? So we wanted to ask, do you have a relationship with the UN Refugee Agency and any other agencies? Um, close to two-thirds said that they had a relationship with the UNHCR, and so that when we asked them about have you served anybody who's LGBTI in the last year? If you look at gender identity on the left, you see that those who have a connection to UNHCR are quite a bit more likely to say that they actually served LGBTI refugees than those who didn't. And the same is true for sexual orientation and some other categories as well. But we thought it was quite stark when you looked at gender identity there. 
Um, so those are, this is what we found when we, when we ran the data. And, um, you know, I think what was probably surprising to us, as I mentioned, was that, there, that while there is some variance in terms of regional responses, it's pretty similar. And um, I think one of the things that struck us, though, when looking at the data is that um, although we got a great response rate, 25%, maybe 35%, we wondered what was going on with the other 65 75%. And I think the concern from a methodological perspective is some of the worst environments for LGBTI refugees, um, you know, the person who receives that survey is just going to go, delete. And so we're not really sure, you know, how do you interpret that and what do you do with that information? And I think that in sitting with this data, we've come to the conclusion that this is a starting point. Um, and that while it's a great way of looking at what well-educated managers of NGOs around the world serving refugees are saying, maybe it raises some questions for us about the organizations that don't want to respond to the survey, and also what's going on with the frontline staff. So a manager might say, of course, willing, able, great, deserve protection, absolutely. But what's going on with the person answering the phone? What's going on with the person who's the intake officer and so on? In fact, there was a great um, quote from somebody who answered an open-ended question who said, I answered the survey using my own personal opinions. However, I think many others in our organization would have answered very differently. Discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity is extremely common among the folks that we serve and even among our staff. So this is the kind of information that these in-depth interviews are you know, we want to learn a little bit more about and so that we can make recommendations about, you know, do I, do I have ethical, a code of conduct or ethical um, guidelines that includes SOGI issues? Um, how does my frontline staff feel about refugees fleeing persecution based on sexual orientation or gender identity or LGBTI refugees? Um, how can I evaluate that? How can I conduct training or sensitivity training with my staff that's going to be appropriate for them? And where do I go for services or the kind of the resources that I need to, to introduce this training? Because I don't have the foggiest idea, you know, how to train on <laughs> sexual orientation and gender identity issues. How do I get the support that I need to create a welcoming environment? So these are the kinds of things that, um, that we learned from this data. We're really hopeful that we're going to get even more nuanced responses from these interviews. And when we do, we will finalize a report, and uh, and hopefully all of you guys will check it out on the website. I have a question. Yeah. Um, it would be possible to find out you know, from these NGOs that are doing some of the work. Yeah. What do they think are the stumbling blocks? What are, what what is preventing them from doing more? Yeah. Uh, like perhaps identify some three or four key things, and then figure out what everybody agrees is what's the difficulty in getting there or doing it the work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a critical point because until you know what the specific blocks are, you can't then make a, a recommendation. You know, if, if the issue is that nobody wants to talk about it out loud, how can you do a training or how can you raise the issues in a way that create safety for the, the, the staff people, for instance. You know, so there are issues around that as well. And so getting recommendations about those specific blockages or what, you know, challenges and what would be an effective way of addressing those that's culturally appropriate, that's appropriate to the legal environment in that country, is going to be really, really important. Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, was there a question? Sorry. Yeah, was there any information in terms of the, the organizations that you work with, that they were local NGOs or international NGOs? Yeah. And then also the, the staff, if they were local staff or expat? Yeah, you know, actually, we do. Ha I can show you the data there that we did want to know. Are you a local organization, and do you have links to an international <coughs> organization? So we do have that data. Um, I actually don't know what the breakdown is without looking at it. And one of the questions also is, is it international and, and <coughs> local staff to get a sense of that? But yeah, I'll I'll sh I have to show you the Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much.